it's going to be fire. But we praise God and honor him because he's made a way for us to escape that fire. And for that I am grateful and thankful today. Thank you, Mel Chorus, Ms. Vicki, Mr. Martin, Mr. Todd. I give honor, first of all, to my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ, who's done great and is doing great and wonderful things in my life even now for even allowing me to stand behind this sacred desk this morning. I thank him. I give honor to my pastor, Dr. M. R. Smith Sr. in his absence today, my former pastor and my mentor, Pastor Donald R. Ingram Sr. and his wife, Mrs. Ingram and Miss Katrina all of the associate ministers here at First Congregational Church, Reverend Dolores Hunter, who's been facing some challenges, but is still trusting God that she will be back in our midst soon. And to Reverend Kearney and Reverend Johnson and others that might be in the midst, thank you for coming. I greet you this morning in the name of Jesus, and it is not about me by no means, but it's about God's perfect word and what he tells us in his word. So I ask you to pray with me as I come before you with the message, seeking the kingdom of God in the secret place. Let us pray. Kind Father, it's to you that I come this day. And I come in the name of Jesus, God, standing before these, your people. I pray, God, and ask that you speak through me, God, by way of your Holy Spirit. Make it plain, God. Let me be able to make it plain so that even the youngest will understand. And God, I thank you and I praise you for using even me. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Glory to God. In this life, we're going to have trouble. Each and every day. All of us, we are not exempt from it. We face problems, afflictions, suffering, and hardships. Prices at the grocery store are increasing, and the sizes are getting smaller. Repairs are very costly. It is costing more per hour. Clothes are expensive. And the increase goes on and on. Gas, food, and all. We have trouble in our families, on our jobs, in our communities. Everywhere we turn, sometimes there is trouble. We might look and say, I've prayed, I've cried, and it doesn't seem as if the situation is changing. The trouble is still there. But we are told that in this world we're going to have trouble, but to take heart. For Jesus said, I have overcome the world. And that's good news. In the Old Testament that Dr. Bell, Deacon Bell read, the eyes of the Lord watch over those who do right. His ears are open to their cries for help. But the Lord turns his face against those who do evil and will erase their memory even from the earth. The Lord hears his people when they call. When you pray for help, he hears you. He rescues us from all of our troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted. He rescues those whose spirits are crushed. The righteous person faces many troubles, but the Lord comes to the rescue each time. 
We are the righteous of Jesus Christ. We are righteous not because of anything that we have done, but it is because God made Christ, who knew no sin, to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteous of God in Jesus Christ. This should let us know that not only is the Lord looking and watching us, but that his ears are attentive to our cries. He hears his people when they cry and call for help. Not only does he hear our cry, but he rescues us from all of our troubles and whose spirits are crushed and he's close to the brokenhearted. Because we are righteous, we will face many troubles, but the Lord is going to come to our rescue every time. It's nothing we've done or can do to be righteous, but accept Jesus Christ as our Lord and our Savior. And the word is, do not stop praying. Keep on praying. Keep on seeking the kingdom of God. And do it in the secret place. And let not and do not be weary in your well doing. For in due season you're gonna reap. If you don't faint, don't give up. If you faint, you're gonna miss your blessing. But you got to keep standing. And God will hold you up. But you have got to put yourself in his hand. In the sixth chapter of Matthew, we find Jesus giving us advice. He's continuing to preach the Sermon on the Mount to the multitude and his disciples. And the first two words in chapter six, look at it. It says, take heed. That means to watch out. Watch yourself. Jesus is saying to us, be careful. Listen to what I'm about to tell you. Beware. And it's very important. And as I read and studied this over and over again, God showed me six times. It's in chapter six. In secret. I think Father is listed in there. Ten times. And in verses 25 and I think it's 31 or 33, Jesus repeats the same thing over again. Now when this is done, he's saying to beware, to listen. This is very important. This is what's going to sustain you. This is what's going to take you through. Listen to what I'm saying. It's important for us to get along, alone in quietness with God. Who was that? Um, Brother B.C. Cooper, steal away. Just steal away. Get down on your knees. Tell God, and he's going to answer your needs. The world's thinking will mislead us more easily when we are not clear about the desires that God has for us. God sees and knows all about us. He knows the good. He knows the bad. He knows the ugly. But we need to go into our closet. Shut that door. Pray without vain repetition to Almighty God in secret for his kingdom to come. And when we do that, God will answer us. And you know, as I prepared this message, there were three, I asked God, Lord, you give me your word. What would you have me to say? You know who's gonna be in the congregation. You speak to me. And I believe that he did. I, it was confirmed to me on three different occasions. His word. And it was by three people in this church. After God gave me the word, and I studied and started the writing, on Wednesday, 
Deacon Maddox came into the office. And somehow or another, the subject came up about your tithes and how some churches have the $50 line, the $100 line. But the Bible says, don't let your left hand know what your right hand's doing. All right. Come on. That could hinder someone That's right. who didn't have that hundred dollars and who would make them feel less because they didn't have as much. But that's not how God wants it. And then a deaconess came in the office. Deaconess Wilder. And somehow or another the subject came up about how the cost of things were so high. And she said, you know, I have need of this, I have need of that. But the Holy Spirit said to me, I was getting ready to have some service or something disconnected. But the Holy Spirit said, call the company. And in so calling the company, it reduced her bill. It's in the secret places. She was in her home with the door closed, talking to the Lord. She didn't get on the phone and ask nobody what to do. She called Jesus, and Jesus answered her. Hallelujah. And then the next one was the prayer ministry. And when I got the information for the bulletin, my eyes fell upon the third prayer, kingdom focused priorities. Lord, I lift up our priorities as a congregation. Give us ears to hear what your spirit is saying to our church. Open our eyes to see things as you see them. Help us move beyond issues of immediate need to presume, presuming pursuing kingdom issues. Bring us to a place where your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's more than just words we say. I said, Lord, thank you. Thank you, God. I know and I believe and I will go forth as you have instructed me. The kingdom of God is spiritual. Jesus said his kingdom was not of this world. And he preached that repentance is necessary to be a part of his kingdom. And to enter in, you've got to be born again. So when we pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, we are praying for the rule and the reign of the kingdom of God in our lives. This is when Jesus is in charge. On one occasion, Jesus said, For indeed the kingdom of God, that's within you. And that's in Luke 17 chapter. When we are under the lordship of Jesus Christ, and when he is in control of our life, that is the kingdom of God. For the kingdom is of God, and that's not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. And we must allow the Holy Spirit to guide and to direct our life and not quench or ignore the Spirit, but follow the Holy Spirit promptings and heed his warning. Heed. That's what Jesus was saying in Matthew. Take heed. Jesus lays it out very plainly, the do's and the don'ts. The rewards and the non-rewards. It means for us to watch out. Jesus is teaching us this in order to sustain our daily lives. Just about every day of our life, we see signs that warn us to take heed. Many times it will be words of danger, 
warning, caution. Sometimes the warning is indicated by flashing lights or a siren. Many of these warnings can mean the difference between your life or death. Amen. And the same way it is with God's word, it's between life and death. Amen. Jesus said, don't do your good deeds publicly so that you will be admired by others. When you help someone or give to someone in need, don't do like the hypocrites do. And the illustration was blowing the trumpets in the synagogue and streets that will call attention to what you've done. Well, if, when you do, you've got your reward right here on earth, not in heaven. I want my reward to come from God. The Pharisees, they made a great show of their giving to the needy in the synagogue and on the streets, thinking they were proving how righteous they were. But the Lord said it in giving, one should not even let the left hand know what the right hand is doing and that it should be done in secret. You know, I have a problem sometimes myself when someone gives me something. I just want to tell it and they say, don't do it and I'll be saying, but you, but I'm understanding more and more, but I do thank you. He said, but we should give our gifts in secret. And how many I could name in the sanctuary here who's given to me in secret. But when I look at their life, how God is blessing them, blessing their seed over and over again. And he said, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on the street corners where everyone can see them. That's their reward right there on the street corner. The Pharisees has turned their praying into an act to be seen by men and to demonstrate their righteousness. But Jesus said, when you pray, go away by yourself. Go in secret. Shut the door behind you and pray to your Father in heaven. Then your Father who sees everything, he will reward you. And don't babble on and on as the Gentiles do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them for your father. He already knows what you need before you even ask. He knows. Well, if he knows before we even ask, why do we ask? Why should we pray? The Lord knows everything that's going to happen. So does your prayers make any difference? Yes. And the answer to the question is, it's because Jesus told us to pray. How many times have the, your parents have told you to do something? Well, I told you to do it. Do it. Sometimes you don't have an answer right there. But this, God's spirit is telling you to tell that child to do this or, to do, or not to do that. Do it because Jesus said for us to do it. He never asked us to do anything he himself did not do. Each of the four gospel writers shows key moments when Jesus prayed. Matthew shows nine such indication incidents. There are eight in Mark, 13 in Luke, and five in John, and I think that's about total about 35 times. But one day, Jesus was praying on a certain place, and when he finished, one of the disciples said, said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. But isn't it interesting, out of all of the disciples, only one of them asked Jesus to teach them to pray? 
Sometimes it seems that the church is in a similar situation regarding prayer. We talk about prayer, study prayer, say our prayers, but how many of us actually seek, seek earnestly for God to teach us to pray? But I thank God for the prayer ministry here. Amen. And I thank God for them coming forth and for Pastor Smith allowing them and encouraging them Amen. to bring these prayers before the congregation. God is mighty, mighty good. He's an awesome God. But in our prayer and with the disciples, the disciple asking him about praying, Jesus said, we should pray our Father in heaven. As believers, we are joined to Christ as sisters and brothers, and we can call Jesus' Father our Father. But we need to recognize and address who we are praying to, acknowledging that our Father has a kingdom where he reigns and that he is holy and that his name should be kept holy. So we should pray our Father in heaven. Hallowed be your holy, your precious and righteous name. Father, let your kingdom come and let it be done on earth, in my life, as it is in heaven. Father, supply me with what I need today. And, and Lord, give me enough to help someone else in need that you will be glorified. And Lord, forgive me for the sins I have committed against you, Father, and my fellow man, and forgive me for the things that I should have done and I neglected to do so. I confess, Father, I have sinned, and Lord, you know my weaknesses, and the enemy knows them also. So do not let me yield to temptation, but if I falter and find myself into something I should not be doing, Lord, rescue me from the evil one. Father, I know and I believe you will do it for me because in your kingdom you rule and there's your power and your glory. My brothers and sisters, be it known that for whatever the reason or how you might want to justify it, fire. If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you refuse to forgive others, trying to justify it, your Father will not forgive your sins. You cannot walk in fellowship with God if you refuse to forgive others. It's nothing that no one has ever done to anyone that you can't forgive. When I think about and when I hear all what Jesus Christ went through, and it was not for himself, it was for us. And even while he was on the cross dying, being crucified, what was his prayer? Forgive them, for they don't even know what they're doing. But yet and still we can walk around here and hold grudges one against each other. And we shouldn't do that. We need to let it go. And if you can't let it go, ask God to help you. Ask him. He'll do it. Just tell him all about it. Lord, you know what happened. Lord, you know why I feel this way. But Lord, your word say I need to forgive for you to forgive me. So Lord, help me to remove it from me, God, in the name of Jesus. You go in your secret closet and pray that. See what God will do for you. Yes, he will. Oh, bless his name. Our prayers to that the prayers that Jesus prayed, they were heartfelt prayers. He did not pray in a cold, distant manner, but in a heartfelt supplication, demonstrating empathy and a genuine love for God. We need to realize who we going to, Almighty God, the King who sent his only Son 
and looked away from him and took his righteousness and put on us and took our sin and put on him. What a mighty God we serve. Proper prayer also requires us to have a truthful understanding of God and what he has revealed to us through his word. It's in his word that we find life. His word is life. I sing used to tell us, read a verse every day. We have iPhones, earphones, all kind of phones iPad, computer, internet. You can look up a verse. If you have to repeat the same verse every day, let God know that you recognize him. You recognize his word. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Hallelujah. We need to also know when we pray to begin our prayer with worship. We need to be reverence to God. We need to include requests, petitions, and to know that God is in his kingdom and he hears us. And in this sixth chapter of Matthews, Jesus said also, when you fast, don't make it obvious. Do not try to look so miserable that people will admire you for your fasting. That's the only reward you're going to get. But when you fast, comb your hair, wash your face, put on some lipstick. <laughs> Women, look to the Lord. Look your best then no one would notice that you are fasting except your father. But he will reward you openly. And don't store up treasures here on earth. Because here on earth moth eat them and rust destroys them. Thieves break in and steal them. But store up your treasures in heaven. Where moth and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal because wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will be also. The Pharisees' intent was to build treasures, great treasures here on earth. But treasures built here will decay. But those that are stored up in heaven can never be lost. Then Jesus said, no one can serve two masters. For you will hate one or you're going to love the other. You will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and be enslaved to money. If so, you're going to be singing like the rapper, got my mind on my money and my money on my mind. And if that's the case, you are not thinking about the Lord and his kingdom. So take your mind off your money and your possessions and your possessions and your money off your mind and turn to Jesus, seeking his kingdom and righteousness in the secret place. For where your treasure is, there will be your heart also. Their eyes also were spiritually diseased. They were coveting money and wealth and spiritual dollars. They were slaves to the master of greed. And their desire was money was so great that they were failing in their service to the master. If a person is occupied with the things of God, the true master, how will he care for his ordinary needs in life? We're going to need food, clothing, shelter. The Pharisees, in their pursuit of material things, had never learned that we have to live by faith. We have to trust God and to know that he will take care of us. Jesus said, this is why I tell you, don't worry about everyday life things. Whether you have enough money or drink, 
or enough clothes. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Jesus gave them several illustrations. Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns. Your heavenly father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? And can your worrying add a single moment to your life? Not a moment can it add. And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the fields and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all his glory was not dressed as beautiful as they were. And if God cared so wonderful for wild flowers that are here today and thrown in the fire tomorrow, he will certainly take care of you. Amen. So why do you have so little faith? Why don't we take him at his word and stand on his promise? Amen. God, you said you would supply my need. God, I don't know how I'm going to make it. But God, I'm trusting you to do everything that I need. Lord, you know this bill needs paying. God has a way of showing us also, even when we are wrong and spent the money for something else that you should have been paying that bill with, still go to God. Confess to him, Lord, I've done wrong, but God, I need you. How many times have I called on him? To tell him that I need him. And by his Holy Spirit he has revealed to me so many things. Sometimes the children ask me questions. I don't know. I don't know. Don't even ask me. Well you said do this so why is it? I don't know. But I'm waiting on the Lord to give me an answer. Just last week. Week before last. I went to bed and I didn't sleep. Nothing was wrong that I knew of. And the Lord didn't let me toss and turn. But he kept me in prayer. All night. All night long. But he gave me strength to get up the next morning. And when I got up, I got a call from my daughter. Who drives an 18 wheeler. And it keeps me in prayer. But she said, you know what happened to me about 3 o'clock this morning? She says, I ran into a family of deers. She says, I looked, the deer was looking at me, and I was looking at the deer. The mama and the daddy was looked like over on the right, and some of the other children, but there was one right there in the middle. She says, all I could do was go through him and kept going. And she says, I thought about how deers come through the window. But even then, God had me in prayer. He had me in prayer. I didn't know what was wrong. And I wasn't worried. God had me quiet. I was still. But I just couldn't sleep. And not sleeping, I just began to thank him. God, I praise you. God, you've done so much for us. God, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. And that was all night. Glory to your name, Lord. Thank you for Jesus who paid a price I could not pray, pay. Thank you, God, for my children, Lord. Lord, cover them with the blood of Jesus. Lord, I thank you. And then morning, that's when the news came. So God will meet you in the secret place. Yes, he will. Jesus says again, in verse 31, that was 25, where he said, don't worry, look it up. And in 31, he says again, so don't worry about these things. 
what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, what you're going to wear. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. We are believers. But our Heavenly Father already knows our needs. Seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously. And he will give you everything you need. He will, he will, he will. We are to seek the things of God as a priority over the things of the world. Primarily, it means we are to seek the salvation that is essential in the kingdom of God because it is of greater value than all the world's riches. This world is not our home. And each and every day, I'm learning it more and more. This is not my home. I'm telling the children more and more. I'm going to leave you. Amen. This is not my home. I want you to be prepared because you're going to leave one day too. And I want to see my children in heaven. I look forward to looking to their face. More I look forward to seeing my Savior though. I want to see my Savior and tell him thank you Jesus. Thank you God. For doing for me what I couldn't do for myself. Oh God, I bless your holy and your precious name. Oh, glory to the, to your name. Now this does not mean that we should neglect the reasonable and daily duties that help sustain our lives. Jesus is saying, seek first the kingdom of God. Go into the secret place. For there I am. Cry out to me. Have a talk with me. Tell me all about your troubles. I'm the one that can do something about it. I'm the one that can lead, guide, and protect you. I'm the one. But for the Christian, we should have a different attitude than the world. If we are taking care and doing what God says and seeking his salvation, living in obedience to him, sharing the good news of the kingdom with others, then he's going to take care of us. And if that's the arrangement, why do we worry? When you start to worry, stop it. It's not going to change a thing. But look to God. Lord, you know this is on my mind and heart. And Lord, I was about to worry, but Lord, I'm looking to you. I'm trusting you, God, to do what needs to be done. So God, I'm asking you and thanking you for doing it. But how do we know sometimes if we are truly seeking God first? There are questions we can ask ourselves. How do we spend our energies? Is all of our time and money spent on goods and activities that's going to perish? Or is it in the service of God? Believers who have learned to truly put God first can rest in him. So don't worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow is going to bring its own worries. Today's troubles is enough for us today. It's good to have friends. It's good to have acquaintances. But it's better to have Jesus. And Jesus said that he would be a friend to us. And as I come to a close, it was a young man that was engaged to be married to a lady whom he had known and loved for a long time. The preparation had been made for the wedding ceremony, the date set, but shortly before the wedding, 
his promised bride was accidentally drowned and he was plunged into the deepest sorrow. But in this sorrow, he found the friendship of Jesus, who was the comforter and burden bearer for him. From this sad experience, Joseph Scruven came to a deep sense of his dependence upon Christ and of the greatest truth so helpfully expressed in these lines. What a friend we have in Jesus. All of our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege it is to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pains we bear. And it's all because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. If there are trials and tribulations, is there trouble anywhere, never be discouraged, but take it to the Lord in prayer. Can you find a friend so faithful who will all your sorrows share? Jesus knows all about our weakness. Take it to him in prayer. Are you weak and are you heavy laden, cumbered with a load of care? Precious Savior, he's still our refuge. Take it to him in prayer. Do your friends despise you and forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. And in his arms he'll take and shield you. And thou will follow souls there. My brothers and sisters, know that we have a friend in Jesus who is our Lord and our Savior. We can and we will stand and we will make it home because Jesus is our Lord. He is our Savior. And when we seek God first in his kingdom and righteousness in the secret place, he will come to our aid. Amen. Won't you stand, please?